Hi, I'm Lynn Brockington, Community Experience Coordinator at West Vancouver Memorial Library. Welcome to the third in our trio of gardening talks. We have Linda Gilkinson with us again, and if you were able to join our webinar last week on resilient gardening, you'll know how fortunate we are to have her back. Linda has been a keen organic gardener on the West Coast for over 30 years. She has a PhD in entomology and worked as the research director of a biological control company and then for the BC government coordinating programs to reduce pesticide use. She has written books on gardening, including Backyard Bounty, The Complete Guide to Year-Round Organic Gardening in the Pacific Northwest, and it's now in its second edition. Linda is also a regular instructor in master gardener programs and gives talks and workshops on organic gardening and pest management for community education programs, garden clubs, and other groups. She currently lives on Salt Spring Island, where she enjoys harvesting food from her garden all year round. Okay. Here you are. Here Hi. Are. Great. You have arrived. Excellent. I've arrived. Okay, great. Good. So um, I'm going to. I'm going to mute myself now and turn off my video and I'll just uh, turn it over to Linda. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to share screen. Thank you, Lynn. Well, I, I know you're all out there because in the past webinar, we, we realized there were quite a few people. So um, I'm going to talk tonight about how to um, have a successful year round vegetable garden in this climate. And I'm really emphasizing, um, Garden design and and the soil feeding the soil that seems to be um, a, an area where especially beginning gardeners have some trouble getting soil fertility up to what it should be and then I'm going to talk about the kind of schedules we need to do to get uh, food um, such food that we're going to harvest in the winter and food that's actually going to overwinter and we can pick it next spring and that includes some really intensive ways to increase maybe the amount of uh, vegetables that you're growing in the size of garden that you have because most of us actually don't have a very big garden on salt spring and many of you probably have this too we have to fence every inch for deer so any any garden is already a fairly expensive proposition so um, I'm really into very intensive planting methods and I'll talk a bit about some of these other topics and um, the questions uh, at the end I'm happy to take questions on anything I have pictures of pests and, and different common gardening problems that we might be able to get at. So let's get going with garden bed design and soil first and get that sorted out. So just so that we're all on the same page, just in case you're a gardener that maybe was used more to landscape plants or even native plants, um, what vegetables need is more than anybody, any other kind of plants need. They need direct sunshine, um, six hours minimum, eight hours better uh, during the growing season. Um, we're going to have food all winter. Things are not going to grow in the winter, so we don't have to worry about whether there's sun on your garden in the winter time. Um, now, and they need a high level of available nutrients, and it's just much more food has to be at their little root tips than uh, would be required for a rose bush or a, a tree or something. And they also need uh, soil that has uh, a pH, which is a measure of how acid it is, that is close to being neutral. And the reason I bring this up is that um, most of us, not, not necessarily every garden, but a lot of soils on the coast, it, the most common condition is that it's quite acidic, very acidic, and grows blueberries beautifully and rhododendrons beautifully. But when we get into other plants, uh, garden, or sorry, vegetables, they don't thrive at that. And they'll need the addition of limestone, which is readily available and easy to do. And then of course, I mean, gardens need water and vegetables need a lot of water. Um, they need, during our dry season, they're going to need water every, every week, um, maybe twice a week if it's very, very hot. But I can talk, I will talk about a few ways to reduce the amount of water that they need. So starting off, how deep should the soil be? If you're in, um, you know, uh, you, say you're building beds on top of an old, in this case, uh, an old driveway, some friends were gardening, 12 inches of soil of 30 centimeters is very difficult to garden in. 
Um, it would be much better to have a minimum of, of uh, 45 centimeters or 18 inches. And of course, if you could do two feet, that's even better. But if you're building beds on top of existing soil, then the beds wouldn't be, uh, need to be nearly as deep because the existing soil underneath will become part of the garden. The roots will reach down to that. Um, and I, I actually, um, I always think that it's much better to spend your money on buying amendments like compost and organic fertilizer than it is to buy soil. If you have soil of any kind, even if you think it doesn't look very good, it will be much better to, to just build that soil up and make a good quality garden soil out of it. So unless you are gardening on rock or gravel or filling quite deep beds, you probably don't need to buy soil. So if you do buy soil, try and buy the very best quality soil you can. And I'll just warn you that soils that are sold as good gardening soil, they don't actually have nearly enough nutrients for vegetables, but they'll be a good texture for the garden. So it'll be fine, but you will still have to uh, amend it quite a bit to have a successful vegetable garden. So um, raised beds are very popular on the coast for a very good reason, because they provide good drainage. And what I mean by raised beds is usually they have sides, although they don't have to necessarily, but the soil is higher than the pathways so that water drains off. The beds warm up earlier in the spring. If you're gardening on a slope or on rock or a patio, as I just showed you, you will need sides and a bed and, and the beds will be raised because you have to have some way to contain that soil and hold it on the spot. Um, someone with a bad back might very much prefer a, a raised bed. This one, this picture is actually, it's a little hard to see, but this is already raised beds on top of a raised bed. So it brought this gardening beds up to the height where the gardener could easily bend over and it wasn't backbreaking work. The only thing about raised beds, however, is the soil does dry out quickly. And that's an advantage if you're in a low-lying wet spot. But it's not an advantage if you're on a very well-drained site or you might have sandy soil. Uh, it takes more water. Um, and of course, there's money to be spent building these beds. So it, there isn't a magic to raised beds unless you have a particular need for the drainage or the height. Beds don't have to have sides. They can actually be ground level. This is just the walkways here. And there's, these are um, permanent beds, but they don't have necessarily to be raised. And in this case, this gardener has raised beds, but the soil is just heaped up. So if you're renting, or you're not sure you're going to be where you are for, for too long, or you're in a community garden, and you don't want to have a large investment, but you need want to raise the beds, then heaping the soil up works really very well. It doesn't, as long as you're not going to walk on this soil, it won't spread out sideways and, uh, you know, and then sort of migrate away. So um, there's, permanent beds are a great idea, but again, they don't even have to be raised. So it just depends on your circumstances. So where you're gonna grow things in the winter time, anytime you can find a place that is um, protected from the weather, uh, a little more protected than maybe the rest of the garden, that's great. The, in this case, excellent drainage is absolutely essential because of the winter rain. So you might still have to have a few raised beds in a garden when they're not all raised beds, but maybe you will have difficulty growing winter vegetables if the soil is too waterlogged. And so that would be why you might want to raise the soil up. But um, you might also find that you have some spots that you're in your yard that you haven't thought of as good vegetable gardening spots because they don't really get much sun in the summer. This picture here with the, uh, the stone bed here was actually at a house I used to own and um, had quite the south side had a very, very wide overhang. And in the summer, the sun was only right here. It only came to this little edge in front. And I would just put petunias in here and let them sort of sprawl around. But this picture was taken, uh, I think, in early March. It was the best bed I ever had to grow salad greens for the winter because they were protected from the rain, but and they were warmer against the building. This is the this is my basement wall here, the vents to the basement, uh, and it was just it was just a wonderful spot to grow winter greens, which are not that happy about getting rained on all the time. 
And again, as I mentioned earlier, don't worry about sun exposure in the middle of the winter, but um, do look for sort of more protected spots that you might, might use. And just a few notes on pathways. You have to get around the garden somehow. Um, permanently growing plants that can be mowed is one rather easy solution if you're already mowing a, a lawn elsewhere. If you have clover pathways or sod, uh, that's easy to maintain with a mower. You can just make the path as wide as your mower. Uh, most paths, you can make them any width you want to. And of course, in my garden, you'll see some slides as we go. You'll probably wonder where there is any paths because I make quite narrow paths. I, I have, um, I keep expanding my beds without changing the paths because I, I want to grow ever more vegetables. And a e very easy pathway solution is to put down something, um, heavy paper like newspaper or cardboard, undo some boxes, and then uh, use that to mulch the pathway, which really kills the weeds. Absolutely just completely keeps them under control. And then I put wood chips or I actually have a big arbutus tree and part of the year I can get enough arbutus leaves. They look very nice spread on top of the cardboard or paper and uh, it's very neat and it's a permanent um, weed killing mat and next year I just can lay down more paper if I need to and put more leaves on top or wood chips or whatever you have. What doesn't work very well in the long term is stone pathways, gravel pathways, landscape fabric, the weeds always get into those. Uh, they root right in on top of landscape fabric. And uh, our fire departments are being very adamant now about warning us about uh, those fine bark mulches. When they dry out in July and August, they are a pathway for fire to move um, to your house, <laughs> basically. There's a rather horrifying video watching the, uh, the flames just shoot right down a bark pathway. So if you're in an interface zone, uh, that's not a good plan uh, for bark. Wood chips don't do that. Wood chips are uh, quite moist. So just some tips there. Now going on to our fertile soil. Nitrogen is the uh, element that plants, vegetables need in the highest amount uh, of all of the elements. And yet it's usually in the shortest supply in an organic garden in the first year or two. And that's because the nitrogen does not come from the soil part, like the uh, minerals in the soil. There is no nitrogen there. Nitrogen only comes from the living or recently dead <laughs> component, a component of the soil. It comes from the compost and uh, any other amendments that we put into the soil that were originally alive, like think blood meal or... Um, uh, fish, fish waste or fish compost, that sort of thing. So nitrogen is coming from uh, a buildup of organic matter in the soil. And it just takes a few years to build up enough that it's continually becoming available to plants. So if you think of your garden as a, uh, it's like a safe deposit box, you don't get any interest back from your nitrogen deposits for the first couple of years. And then you get more each year. And the more nitrogen you put, more organic matter you put in, the more your nitrogen interest is that comes back to your garden. And after, after a year or two, there is enough nitrogen being um, broken down by the soil microbes and made available to the plants. The other important elements are potassium, which you'll see in the fertilizer. The fertilizers, the commercial fertilizers will give you numbers that show you nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that order on the bag. Oddly enough, phosphorus is not needed in nearly as much quantity as potassium, calcium, and magnesium, but it is a common um, for element in fertilizer. And yet most of our soils actually have quite a lot of phosphorus. It's just not necessarily very available to the plants. So um, I'll talk about how, to, how that's going to become more available in a moment. Uh, micronutrients, you may have heard of people worrying about whether they might have zinc deficiencies or, or um, other elements. In an organic garden, when you're using compost and a variety of ingredients and, and tree leaves and all of these ingredients have plenty of micronutrients already in them. They, there are all kinds of trace elements there. So it's just not a problem in an organic garden using these kinds of amendments. But what we do have to remember is that compost alone 
is usually not enough to provide, not, does not provide enough nutrients, especially homemade compost, which will be fairly low in nitrogen. It's very valuable, absolutely do it, but unless it's uh, something like fish compost and well decomposed, it's not quite going to have enough in the way of nutrients, but this is very easily remedied. Very, very good organic fertilizer products are available. I did want to talk about the microbes in the root zone. These are the, these are the creatures that are breaking down that organic matter and are also, they also work on the uh, minerals in the soil and making them available to plant roots. So the really interesting thing, and this is recent science, I mean, this is in the last maybe 15 years, um, the discovery that plants um, actually leak a lot of the sugar that they make back out into the soil through their roots. And it's like, why do they do this? I mean, why would they? And it's tremendously beneficial to the microbes that live around their roots. So the plants are basically, uh, one researcher said, they're putting out cakes and cookies for the uh, micro microbes, which means bacteria. Protozoa are little one-celled organisms that eat bacteria. There are fungi, and some of you may have heard of mycorrhizal fungi. They're really key in helping plants get phosphorus out of the soil. But there's a whole host of organisms. It, it goes right up. The, the, the protozoa eat bacteria. Earthworms, that's, their diet is protozoa. And earthworms do a tremendous amount of shredding of plant material, making it available. Fungi and bacteria break it down. So they do uh, the hard work of making the nutrients available. And there are special bacteria that actually can take nitrogen from the atmosphere, which is in a form that plants can't use. Most of what we breathe, we might think we're breathing oxygen, and yes, there's some there, but mostly we're breathing nitrogen. But it's not a form of nitrogen that a plant can use. These bacteria take that form of nitrogen and convert it into a form that plants can take up through their roots. So the more the research goes on in this field, the more absolutely astonishing it is. I mean, it's just, it's stunning. Um, it's a difference in how plants can take up iron and nutrients, and some of these um, organisms stimulate root growth. Um, some physically protect the, the uh, roots. This uh, beet here, note the nice beet, look at the weird looking roots. These are probably actinomycetes, which is a, a fungus-like group, and they're actually coating the roots. And you would think that, that this looks like a disease, but clearly that's a lovely beet. There's, this is a very beneficial relationship that's going on there. So if you want to learn more, if you Google USDA soil biology primer, you will get a very readable um, chapter by chapter online document, it's free. And uh, it's just, it's really interesting to read. And I, I recommend that you do it because you'll have a new respect for what we mean when we're feeding the soil is we're not feeding the soil, we're feeding the soil microbial community. And then those creatures are feeding our plants and our plants are feeding them, which is, is quite, a, quite an interesting story. Okay, so how do we build up the organic matter? Uh, well, why we want organic matter is obviously to get this slow release of nutrients. Um, but it's also like little sponges in the soil. And if you have sandy soil, it'll it improve the ability of that soil to hold water in the summertime. And if you've got clay soil, which is very, very fine particles, so that it compacts easily and it uh, doesn't drain well, um, it improves the aeration to have these little sponges basically mixed into the soil. And as organic matter is broken down, the super digested form is called humus. And that is sticky, it's like brown goo. It doesn't look like uh, compost anymore. It's really down to the very sticky elements. And that is how soil structure is improved. It sticks together the particles of the soil and a lot makes it hold water better. And nutrients are much more available from humus. And that holds carbon in the soil, which is very important too, not to be letting any more carbon going into the atmosphere than, than is already on its way. So what kind of uh, organic matter? Any kind of organic matter. Compost of all kinds. Leaves, you can compost them first or just use them straight on the garden. Uh, plant roots, I'll talk more about that in a minute. And crop waste, just keep that stuff all right there in the garden. 
Uh, grass clippings really benefit the lawn, but sometimes if you have surplus clippings, if you were away and the lawn was lawn when you cut it, of course, grass clippings can certainly be used, but any organic material. Uh, people even use shredded paper, and the trick there is to get it really wet first so it goops, sticks down to the soil or it'll blow all over the yard. So leaves. In urban areas, we are absolutely blessed with free, um, free material that we can use to, as a mulch, and that just as a mulch in the summer, in, it's among the corn here, it's keeping this, um, the water from evaporating from the soil. It's keeping the soil cooler. Uh, in the winter, uh, mulches protect the soil from heavy rain, from erosion. At any time, mulches control weeds. And they are also continually being broken down. So there's this continuous addition of, to the soil organic matter. So I fill bins, I mix it with compost and that you can get leaf mold. But I also stockpile some dry leaves every year in the fall. The, usually, usually the first leaves that you rake up are probably when it's driest. I stockpile those. You can put them in a bin with a lid on it. Any, whatever you do, you want to keep them dry because then I've got bags of mulch now for next, this garden this summer. So they're for, next, they're for the next season garden because at this time of year, the leaves that have fallen naturally have all been collected or decomposed and there's nothing to pick up. And I said I would talk about roots in a moment and this is what I mean. The roots of your crop plants should stay in the garden unless there's some particular reason like a big cabbage stalk gets in the way or something, uh, you know, take it out if that's the case. But um, I'm, this example here of a corn, this is a corn plant. Um, that's what the root system looks like on the day I would harvest the corn. If I just cut it off right here and leave it in the soil all winter, that's what I get out in the garden in the spring. So all of this fine, organic matter and all of the bacteria and microorganisms uh, of all sorts that lived there stayed in your garden. If you hauled this all off to the compost bin, it's a lot of work, it's very unnecessary, and you will kill those little guys if they go through a com hot composting process. So roots decompose really fast. Um, and if it's legumes, the peas and beans, um, they actually, are able to produce nitrogen in the soil because they have bacteria essentially that parasitize their roots and make these little pink tumors. Inside that, the bacteria are taking nitrogen from the air and converting it to something the pea plant can use. And once that pea plant is killed, or you cut the tops off, then these nitrogen factories break open and the nitrogen is available to the next crop. So leave the roots in the soil. A quick trip through fertilizers. Um, NPK uh, means nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and K, <laughs> K stands for potassium. That's not at all intuitively obvious. The numbers on fertilizers give you the percentage. So uh, the Gaia Green all-purpose organic fertilizer is 4% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, 4% potassium. The thing to watch for is this nitrogen number that it is equal to or more than the phosphorus number for vegetables. And this is or, or Gunik, I cannot say the name of this brand. There are a number of brands around. I'm not, I'm not saying these are the best brands to buy. I'm just giving you examples of the kind of products that we see this year. And some places, some nurseries, some garden centers get a custom blend that they get made, and it's 444. One that was available here is 244, and I have to warn people to add some nitrogen, um, a better nitrogen source when they use that fertilizer. Uh, and here's some ideal amendments. Alfalfa meal, 2.5 nitrogen, 1% phosphorus, 1% uh, potassium. It's actually, or, or, yeah, is, is actually really quite good. Uh, that's a good ratio. And fish compost uh, is, is the same. Both of those amendments actually look low, but that's a good level of nitrogen to phosphorus to potassium in, um, in, a, in a soil amendment. If you really need to bump up the, blood, the, the uh, nitrogen, blood meal, if you uh, don't mind using animal products in your garden, blood meal is the quickest, fastest way to add 
nitrogen and you don't need very much of it at all. It's 12% um, nitrogen. The bone meal, I have a, a warning here. It's quite common for people to overuse bone meal. I mean, you'll hear of rose growers that every year they throw a handful of bone meal under their roses. And that is, eventually the phosphorus levels get so high that it ties, it, that unbalances the soil and it ties up other elements. And so you really don't want to do that. So I, I don't even suggest people buy bone meal unless they've already got some blood meal. And some sometimes, like I burn wood, so I have potassium. So I might make a fertilizer with blood meal, bone meal, and wood ashes, which are very high in potash or potassium. But if I think what most people should really do is get one of the already balanced all-purpose fertilizers, and then you don't have to worry about ratios and if you're overusing um, phosphorus compared to the nitrogen. And I'll just have to say, I can't believe how common a nitrogen deficiency is. I did a, a workshop in a local community garden here where we could actually walk around the real garden all spaced out. And um, I'd say at least a third of the plots were low on nitrogen. And you can tell this by, in this case, this is corn. It's a little, this is a little greener over here and a little yellow over here, but they're all too light. So a light yellow color in crops is definitely a nitrogen deficiency. Now this is some composted, um, uh, it was a fish compost from a supplier. There was something wrong with their batch and these people had put it into their uh, community garden beds and this, the, everything that needed nitrogen could hardly survive. I mean, there are these little plants that are just dying. And of course the peas are enormous, but guess what? Peas make their own nitrogen. So the peas were happy enough, but everything else was really suffering. It was a perfect diagnostic picture for nitrogen deficiency. If in the first year or two of a new garden, you might want to, to sprinkle some blood meal where you're putting um, uh, individual plants like squash or corn that are heavy feeders and they're going to be, the roots are in, 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 in individual areas, not like lettuce that might be sown over a whole bed. Um, so you might want to dig in a little bit of blood meal or alfalfa meal or well, one of the fish composts like sea soil or um, earth bank. One of those, they, um, they're quite good in, uh, as an amendment, right, where a plant will go. And be prepared to have to um, possibly add some liquid fertilizer during the summer. This is in your first year or two. I had to do it in the garden I have now for the first two summers. It was a brand new soil out from under trees, actually, so uh, a treed area, and it had had, had no amendments at all. So um, uh, after the second year, there was absolutely no need to do it. But in this community garden that I was in last weekend, um, they really needed to give some of those plants a quick shot of soluble nutrients. And you'll see a if you're trying to remedy a nitrogen deficiency, you'll see the plants get darker colored and start growing within a week or two, 10 days to two weeks, you will see a response. It's pretty quick. In fact, sometimes actually a way to diagnose nitrogen deficiency is give them some nitrogen in, in water, like fish fertilizer or something. And if they respond quickly, then you know that it was a nitrogen deficiency. So you can, uh, you can make your own very cheap um, all we're trying to do is take the soluble nutrients out of something like a bag of horse manure, just one shovel of horse manure or some earth bank or sea soil co fish compost in a bucket of water. And we're just soaking it for a day or two. That's all we're going to do because we're trying to just get the soluble nutrients and nitrogen is highly sol soluble. And as in this case, this is a shovel full of horse manure. Um, now you're going to dilute that. You'll take that liquid out and dilute it to this color before putting it on the garden. You can certainly buy um, concentrated fish fertilizer, and there are other products, and uh, you know there'll be like a tablespoon to a liter or two of uh, water, and they'll tell you on the, on the bottle how to mix it. You water it in around the roots of the plants. Now another part of the picture is, is uh, as I mentioned earlier, is that um, many soils here are naturally acidic. That's the natural state of soil in a high rainfall area and um, under the kind of trees that we have, most areas have. 
so the, our pH here, if you're if you're thinking of numbers, a lot of soil, native soil is 5.1, 5.3, and we need to make the soil less acidic by adding ground up limestone. And and you know sometimes people say, well, I think my potatoes grow fine. Potatoes grow in acid soil, and so do tomatoes. They tolerate it well enough. But if you're not able to grow lovely beets and carrots, but you're growing lovely potatoes, then that's actually really diagnostic for the fact that your soil is too acidic because beets are the most sensitive crop to pH. They just do not like it at all unless the pH is up. So um, if your beets are poor and your potatoes are great, you probably have an acid soil. I'll show you this little diagram. The chemists have a scale for acidity of the soil, and alkaline soil um, would be like the prairies, and our, uh, naturally the coastal soils are probably in here. So this is a scale that actually goes from 1 to 14, so 7 is the middle. So 7 would be completely neutral, and, and tap water would be around 7, although tap water is often just slightly acidic. What these black bars show you is they're just a, a relative idea of which nutrients become most available at this, at this range of pH. And nitrogen is most available closer to this neutral um, zone here. And uh, as it gets more and more acidic, less and less nitrogen becomes available. And that's because the soil microbes that we want to thrive do not thrive at, in acid soil. Only the fungi thrive in acid soil, but the bacteria don't. And the bacteria are a really important group uh, for making nitrogen available. So we have this kind of best of all possible, uh, you know, zone here where the things that we want to become available are available and the things that we don't want, which is the heavy metals. And aluminum should be on this here somewhere. Aluminum is a very common, it's a naturally occurring element in our soil and iron. But plants can take up too much of it when the soil is acidic and they'll have symptoms of toxicity and not grow well. And it's not just because the, the soil is acidic, acid, it's because the soil is acid and that makes them take up these uh, heavy metals too, too much. So we add ground limestone and um, then, then the nutrients that we want are more available and the heavy metals that we don't want are less available. We have this healthy community of soil microbes, and we also add calcium. And, and if you remember the earlier slide, calcium was right up there as the third most common, uh, most used element in the greatest quantity for plants. So you might be asking, how do you know um, if your soil is acid? There are soil test labs around that will do a pH test. There's several on the lower mainland. Some garden centers will take in your, your soil sample um, you can Google this or look it up. Um, what you don't want to do is get a test from using a little kit that you get at the at the uh, garden center, or using an electric pro electronic probes. Those are not accurate at all. And the reason they don't work is that they can only tell you what the pH is of that little tiny bit of soil that you touch with the probe or the kit, the paper or whatever you're do whatever kind of kit it is. And in fact, soil pH you know, from particle to particle within the soil can vary very widely. What you're doing when you're getting your soil tested at a lab is you're taking an average sample of soil over the whole bed and taking a set of that and you're getting an average reading. You can't get that from a test kit. Um, so, you know, when you have to add lime, the, uh, usually the, the company that's doing the test will ask you what you're going to grow, and usually there'll be a recommendation for how much lime, or if you need lime, or if you don't need lime for that crop. And um, generally, a common rate of application, if you're trying to raise the pH, is half a kilogram per square meter, which is about, um, oops, there's a typo there, I'm sorry, that should be one pound per square yard. Um, it's one pound per square yard or half a kilogram per square meter. And that's actually not very much ground up limestone. It's, um, it's half of a cottage cheese container of a little uh, half liter cottage cheese container. Half of that is half a kilogram. And um, you can just measure that out with a cottage cheese container a couple times, sprinkle it on the soil, and you can see how white the soil looks. And then just go ahead and sprinkle it that way. It's not critical that you have exactly the exact number of grams per, per square, square meter. 
and uh, people will ask what kind of cal uh, what kind of lime get what you can get um, there is sometimes a shortage of one or the other calcitic lime comes from a kind of rock that just has calcium dolomitic lime that kind of limestone actually has calcium and magnesium and they're both great dolomite is usually more expensive and it's a good plan to use it but you don't need it very often maybe every five or ten years um, and if that's all you can get that's fine use it but if you have a choice uh, calcitic lime for most years and dolomite every now and then is fine so the soil fertility program i've really spent a lot of time on this because this seems to be the area where people have the most trouble getting their plants um, you know out of the ground and growing properly is compost every year the first year of a brand new garden or, or new soil that you've just brought in from somewhere try and get 10 centimeters on a pretty good thick layer uh, inches of it mixed in after that we're looking at something like an, an inch or an inch and a half or so every year if you can do it and and also a complete organic fertilizer added to the soil as you put the compost in you would put the fertilizer in at the same time and read the label on the product and um, if the garden has been growing for a few years go by how the crops have been if the crops are growing really well then you can back right off there's no need to overuse fertilizer if, if they're not growing well um, then you might need to bump that up a little bit and then if you uh, if you need to lime your soil then all of this can go in at the same time. Spread the compost, the fertilizer, and the lime at once. Now, and you just do it once a year. Even if you're growing multiple crops, like you might grow lettuce and radishes, and after that, it'll be planted to peas, and after the peas, there's still time for more lettuce through the season. As long as you have fed the soil once, you don't need to keep feeding it uh, between crops, because all of these amendments are slow release, and they just build and add to that bank of nutrients in the soil and remember any time in the growing season you can uh, give things a boost if you need to and i had to put the bragging picture in for my leeks because like why wouldn't i right the blue ribbon leeks anyway so this is what the soil looks like in this picture after i've just sprinkled on lime compost and a little bit of fertilizer the, you can't see the fertilizer because it's just little brown grains but now what well Anytime you can minimize cultivation, you're going to have a healthier community of soil microbes and you will build soil organic matter faster in soil that is not cultivated. But we have to do a little bit of mixing here. So once a year, when I lay all this material down, using a fork, I just stir it into the top layers. Now, once your soil is loosened up and you've been adding compost for a few years, you'll probably find that you can just kind of comb it in. What we definitely do not want to do is take a shovel and turn this all upside down. Because the microbes that are benefiting, making this whole system work, are in the, just the top 10 centimeters of soil. If we took a shovel full and turned it upside down, we would put them down into a cold, dark hole where they can't get any air. So we don't want to do that, but we do need to mix in the lime. And uh, so stir the soil, do it once, and don't overdo it. And that preserves your structure. Um, it also minimizes the amount of weed seeds that you bring up. The whole soil column is full of dormant weed seeds, and every time you disturb the soil, up come the weeds. Um, and it, it also allows, if you're on a natural soil column, as opposed to, say, a raised bed that might be on, if, if, it's, just, if it's a bed full of soil on a patio or something, this doesn't apply. But if it's soil that is on a natural soil column below it, Moist, there's a lot of moisture that kind of comes up by, it's called capillary action. It's kind of like it's wicking upwards. And when we break up the soil like this, we disturb that. And uh, that means we end up watering our plants a lot more. And anyway, it's way too much work to be digging up gardens, so don't do it. It's hard. Anytime you can plant without even doing that is better. Whenever possible, just leave the roots in the soil from the previous crop, seed around them, um, it's a way in the spring you can just push seeds into soil that's ready to go and uh, just push the seeds in. You don't have to cultivate it at all. Uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, in the early spring, March or April, I will have planted peas and they're done in July. Um, they're pretty much finished. Uh, so 
in preparation of the bed for the peas, if I have to put in lime or um, some compost, that's what I would do. Then the peas grow. Then I cut the peas off and leave the roots. So now what I have is a bed that has already had its compost and lime. And it also now has nitrogen because the peas grew it in place. And it's also got the mulch because I just leave the pea vines right there on the surface of the soil. So I just take a trowel and go in and plant the, and this I think is a cauliflower actually, but any of your winter broccoli or winter cauliflower or Brussels sprouts, just plant them right in there. Uh, absolutely no work at all beyond cutting down the pea vines and going over and getting your flat of uh, seedlings. The, over here, this is my corn stalks that are cut off. I'm just going to leave them to leave all that organic matter in the soil. And I seeded all the rain. Just see the seeds are beginning to come up here. Um, they don't show up too well in the picture, but I've got uh, lettuce and um, fall greens for, let for salads over the winter is coming up between the corn stalks. So moving on to how we're going to provide um, all food all year round, it's kind of those pictures I just showed you are kind of the intermediate steps. Um, this is my braggy picture from May 7th this year. I was harvesting beautiful cauliflower that week and um, purple sprouting broccoli and scallions and there was chard uh, everywhere. Those had all been in the garden over the whole winter. But the, I was also picking lettuce and zucchini, which I had started this spring and put out in the garden. So it was like both ends of the garden met in this basket of food here. So we have a six month seeding season and a 12 month eating season in our gardens. So what to plant right now? Um, I've blocked in both the April, May because everything in this April, May thing you could still plant now. The weather is just fine to plant all of this plant material now. And we're now in the mid-May, early June period when we can be putting out uh, more warmth loving things. Although I have to say I have some melons that have decided I have um, done something very cruel and put them out and now the weather is cool. So I probably should have held on to the melons and the sweet basil a little longer. But uh, don't be in a rush to put your warm season plants out if the weather's like this. But what I really wanted to show you here is that we have months of planting of all these cool season crops. There's plenty of time in our growing season. Um, when we can plant in the spring depends on the soil temperature and the weather. If it's a late cold spring, we plant later. If it's warm and dry, we plant earlier. And just hold that thought because I'm gonna contrast that with planting for winter. So this is spring planting, basically what we're going to eat this summer and fall. If we try to plant too early, we run into all kinds of problems. Just because it's not too bad in, in February and it's getting better in March doesn't mean that it's actually a good time to put vegetables out. Uh, this is cutworm damage over the winter and uh, there's disease and there's botrytis and there's a zillion slugs. Um, there's cold, late frosts, there's all kinds of things that can happen to little seedlings when we put them out too early. But this is the important thing that we don't see in gardening books for the rest of Canada because nobody else really has this problem. This is called vernalization. And um, what this is, is biennial crops. And we have quite a few of our common vegetables are actually biennials, meaning that they don't, they would produce flowers the second year they're in a garden. So if you've got kale that's finishing up blooming right now, that's a biennial plant. So last summer when you planted the kale, it was just growing leaves. Then the winter happens and that's a signal for biennials that now they're ready to go into their second year. And so when it warms up in the spring, they start producing flower stalks. So chard and onions and kale and all our root crops, celery, all these, all the cap, the big cabbages, some cabbages, some cabbage family plants are not biennials, but most of them are. So all of them, if they're held in the garden over the winter, go to seed in the spring and you can't stop them from doing that. Well, that's all well and good and we would expect them to do that. But what if you put your leeks out this spring and then in July, they start setting up flower stalks. Here we go. And that can happen because if we plant too early and they grow pretty well, and then we get some cold weather, like in April or May, we might get a couple of cold weeks. 
the plants are fooled into thinking winter has happened. And then suddenly in July, you find your chard all going to seed and your kale and your, not your kale, your leeks, your onions, things doing strange things, flowering prematurely. So if you plant too early and your plants are fairly good sized, if we get a cold spell, then we have a risk of this. And like I say, it doesn't happen to anybody in Canada because nobody in Montreal or anywhere else is putting any plants out in March or April, which is what our gardeners really try to do. So very small onion sets can't do this. Very small leeks looking like little blades of grass, they won't convert. Um, seedlings that are really small. So um, if you put out uh, little tiny leek seedlings, this isn't going to happen because they're just not big enough to make this conversion. But um, I used to think that when I bought onion sets, the biggest ones would make the biggest onions. But of course, they're the ones that can vernalize and go to seed on us. So uh, what I really want to emphasize here is that the more overwintered crops you have, the less need you need to sow early anyway. We don't have to go out there and push the envelope on trying to get early crops. If the garden already is full of leafy greens, this is leaf beet that was sown in July, and this was uh, spinach sown in August, and this was cauliflower that was sown last June. This is an April picture. This is what's in the garden in April after all of these things got through the winter. So I don't have to be hurrying out there with plants that might go to seed uh, prematurely. So this is when to plant winter crops. And this is why I was saying, well, um, you know, this how, this how this differs from the spring crop, uh, spring planting rather, is that the planting dates are really critical here. Remember I said you had like four months to grow a lot of those, to seed a lot of those crops I showed you. Well, here we don't have these big planting windows because we need to get the seed started in time to reach the plants to have reach full size before winter. They are not going to grow in the winter. They're just a minuscule amount of growth will happen in cold weather. So they actually have to be done growing or reaching a nice size of cabbage or a full size of leek or nice plump carrots. We need that by the end of October because that's really the end of our growing season in any meaningful way. If we plant too late, uh, these, a lot of these are biennial crops, we plant them too late and they're small, they just go through the winter and what they'll do next spring is just make flowers. They're not going to get bigger carrots or better kale or anything. They will just be um, going on to their normal flowering pathway. So um, narrow little planting windows of a couple weeks. Now, I hope you're not madly scrambling and, and writing this all down because this is planting charts on my website. If you go to my homepage, right in the middle of the homepage, there's a little PDF Click, click on that and you can print this out. Uh, and if you have any of my books, it's in there. There's much more expanded information, but you can print that out right from my homepage. And you'll notice it doesn't say anything about tomatoes because this is the planting schedule for things that we will seed over the course of this summer that we will eat next winter and next spring. So just go there later and, and print that down. And keep it on your fridge or stick it to your a gardening notebook or whatever, whatever, whatever makes it very handy. I have one stuck on my fridge. I still can't remember when to plant things. So the goal here is to have your living refrigerator, which is your garden, completely full by October. This is totally different than gardening elsewhere, where by October people are putting the garden to bed, meaning that their uh, crops are being harvested and stored and they're mulching and they're done. What we want is full-sized crops here. This is all, this, this is not empty actually, this is garlic. This bed is going into uh, the winter completely full of food. And even this bean trellis here, these pole beans, uh, which are obviously not going to continue much longer, I have already seeded underneath them some leafy greens. And I'll show you that in a minute. So every inch of this garden is full of food for the winter time. And that's winter at my house. That's a January harvest from under the snow. There, uh, you'll see leeks in all my pictures. There's Brussels sprouts back here, broccoli. Like, I think the carrot bed was in the front here. But this is the important, um, 
thing here is this garden looks really beat up and it's gone through a miserable winter, but all of the kale and the greens and there's radicchio there coming back. This is a list of everything that was in that garden that day when I took the picture in March. And um, no matter how kind of beat up it looks, it's all going to grow back very quickly. The leafy greens like chard uh, have big roots on them. They have roots like big skinny beets out there and they will very rapidly replace all of that growth and grow very quickly and very well, much more robustly than you could ever do if you started with seeds in the spring. So when you get your garden onto an overwintering schedule, you'll have these really busting ahead robust plants in the spring that can take a few cutworms and slugs and frosty weather and not, and not uh, be too bothered. So the rules for having year-round harvest is to be really aware of the right varieties. Frost hardiness, obviously, for winter, heat tolerance for summer. Uh, when you think about things like lettuce, there are lettuces that can freeze absolutely solid in place. And when the weather thaws out a little bit, they are fine. But it's only some varieties can do that. There are other lettuces that can take quite a bit of heat in the summer without going to seed. But these are not the same varieties. So you need to um, get the right stuff and then sow them at the right time. And uh, the planting chart I showed you, I was just trying to emphasize that, that you plant soon enough that they can get their growing done in the growing season. So uh, here's some examples here of, um, of an important difference. Um, is the cauliflower and broccoli that we use to overwinter is not at the same varieties as what you will be growing and eating this summer. So I have out there some green goliath and some green sprouting broccoli and I seeded it this spring and they're starting to make heads now and I'm going to eat that broccoli all, all winter, I'm oh, sorry, all summer and all fall. And, um, but I, in a few weeks, we'll be starting purple sprouting broccoli, red spear, and that will just sit out in the garden and be a lovely little plant all summer. And by the end of the summer, it'll probably be about two feet high. And um, the cold chill of winter will make this broccoli make heads. And so from the end of February um, or March onwards, I'll start getting broccoli from them. So these are biennials. And they're different than the varieties for summer. So Galleon is a fantastic cauliflower. I will seed it in a few weeks, but I won't see any cauliflower until next spring. So just be aware that there's some differences there. Unfortunately, garden nurseries from whole, get plants from wholesalers, and in August you can see for sale snowball cauliflower, which is going to completely fail in your garden if, as a winter crop. It's not hardy and it will just make little button heads if anything else, if anything happens. Galleon is extremely hardy. I live up a mountain on Salt Spring and it's fine here. So um, just in some cases you need the right stuff. So now we have a tip here about sowing these seeds in the summer. Because you can see an awful lot of this was for summer sowing. The soil dries out really fast. It's too warm. It won't germinate lettuce or parsnips. Um, carrots won't germinate when it's too warm. So plant the seeds a little deeper. Shade the seed bed. Plant the seeds, water it, and then cover it with something, anything. I and mean, this is burlap here, but it could be newspapers, um, you know, beach towels, old bed sheets. I, it doesn't matter as long as it truly shades the soil. And then um, it will also keep the uh, bed evenly moist so seeds germinate quickly. But keep considering that seedlings need to be shaded. You, if you've only been used to seeding things in the spring, you may not realize that when you seed that spinach in August, it's going to need some shade protection if we get hot weather when you have tiny little seedlings uh, um, growing. The soil gets really hot and the little roots just parboil. These plants aren't big enough yet to mulch. So anything you can do, upside down seed trays, make some laugh houses, um, you know, water more, um, all of the kind of common sense things, but just be aware that little tiny plants in the summer need some, need some care. Now the next bit of slides is on using every square inch of soil. I love this view. It was someone's garden on a garden tour in Victoria. You had to, you know, basically just pick your way through the yard because it was just, food was falling off of plants everywhere. It was really amazing. So dense planting, 
do you need rows in a raised bed? Well, you're not going to be walking on your raised bed. That was the, really the point of making a bed that you have pathways on the side. Usually you can space plants a little closer than the seed package, especially if you offset them like this so that they um, have as much root room as possible. And if you're kind of having trouble visualizing that, if you can get a hold of a little piece of chicken wire, like, um, you know, just a sort of a foot square piece of chicken wire, two inch chicken wire, you can lie that down on the ground and put a seed in the middle of each one of these little honeycombs. And that's perfect spacing for all kinds of things, for carrots and beets and lettuce and any of the smaller plants. That's actually perfect spacing just to give you an idea of how, how densely you can plant. But if you're going to plant densely, the soil does need to be very fertile. So in your first year or two of a garden, don't push it too hard. Uh, you're gonna need water and, and, and a, a good nutrient supply. Uh, if things are too crowded, they, you still may need some supplementary liquid fertilizer. But you know, when they're this crowded, they control the weeds. And the, the chard here is actually shading out all these weeds. But be also prepared to keep some law and order here. Um, if your plants are just, uh, in this case, uh, the cabbage is doing fine, but the lettuce really needs to be harvested. This is a spring bed. I just, just started harvesting cabbage, but I had to get the lettuce out because um, this is uh, a little too crowded at this point. So you need to be, just keep an eye on it if you're going to really go for dense planting. And dense doesn't mean overcrowded. Um, these are far too close together here. And any kind of greens of any sort, obviously, can be used in a salad. So just keep thinning them as soon as they come up because um, they'll just choke each other out. They won't grow if they're not thinned. Beets and chard, unfortunately, always have to be thinned because that little seed that you plant isn't a seed, it's a fruit. It's a shriveled up little fruit and inside is several seeds. So that's why the mystery of spacing your seeds out nicely and you still end up with seedlings that you have to thin out. Succession planting is a, is a way to keep um, good quality crops always present in the garden so, um, and, and to keep the best use of space. So, you know, a Dutch grower once told me, he said, never leave a, a place empty more than 24 hours. So just be right on top of it. A plant comes out, plants go in. Plant comes out, put some seeds in, put another plant. Um, use up all that space. And when it's things like lettuce and uh, especially radishes and lettuce that grow very quickly um, and then quickly go off to being a poor quality if they're left too long, uh, just grow small amounts, eat it up, and, and every few weeks so you seed more. And, um, you know, keep succession plantings of corn and beans and peas. And uh, your winter harvest crops can work right in as a summer uh, su as succession. If you think about if you've got a patch of onions or a patch of garlic, if, the, if you grew the onions from sets and if you planted your garlic last fall, it'll all be out in July. And on that planting chart, you'll see a lot of things that can be seeded in July. So that whole block of plants that's coming out in July can be immediately replanted to your winter crops. And I just say, keep editing the garden. If your family's not eating it, or if the lettuce is getting kind of weird, just get it out of there. Pull it up and lay it right down on the ground and use it as mulch. It's going to serve your garden far better than sitting there being a, a crop that maybe nobody wants to eat. So we can push the envelope on interplanting with our favorite plants um, a lot of different ways. You'll probably figure out things that you work really well for you. This is one of my favorites. Um, in interplanting, think about plants that have different heights and different root zones, uh, different root um, depths. So something like lettuce grows quickly and it's shallow rooted. So it can actually be interplanted with almost anything. The, the uh, yellow circles here are, three, are five uh, broccoli plants. And I like the sprouting broccoli, which gets really tall. It gets enormous. They get maybe three or four feet tall and quite wide. At the end of the summer, those five plants will be taking that entire bed. But meanwhile, before that happens, I've got a whole crop of cauliflower that's going to be in there. And of course, when you have a harvest the head of cauliflower, it's over, so we just remove the plant. And um, in before either the cauliflower or broccoli needs the space, I can get a whole crop of lettuce in there. So there's three crops in this bed, but I had, if I was only growing this broccoli, it would have to still be on this spacing because that's how much uh, space those really big plants need. So as I said, lettuce goes well with anything. This is first year just putting strawberries in and uh, 
takes them a little while to grow from the new crowns. The lettuce is great. Put in radishes among carrots. Put, um, this is Brussels sprouts, put some lettuce under that. So um, as long as you're being aware, like the cabbage lettuce picture that I showed you earlier when they were starting to really struggle there, as long as you're ready to sort out the um, interplanting and use up the salad greens if they're getting too crowded. Lots of times we can put uh, winter crops and summer crops in the same bed. This is cucumbers running over the soil here. Uh, cucumbers need a lot of sprawling room if you're not going to trellis them up. And um, I can put the spacing, the, nat the normal spacing for cucumbers still allows me to put the winter, this is a winter cabbage and a winter, I don't know if it's a cauliflower. Anyway, the big winter crops that um, in the summer are not really very big, they don't get much of a size till fall. Um, you can pluck them, plunk them right in the middle of the uh, cucumber patch and let the cucumbers be a living mulch. There's another uh, dense, high density or more intensive planting method called underplanting, and um, commercial growers call it relay cropping. You've got one crop growing, in this case it's squash, and you just underplant the next crop so that when you take the squash out, or the tomatoes, or the peppers, or any of this, you know, crops that will be finished in October, when you take them out, then um, meanwhile, this other crop will have been growing underneath. So this is where that squash was growing. And by the time that has all been hauled off to the compost bin, this is where the roots were. There were several squashes here. The soil is completely covered with greens. And that's what I did under the pole beans that were in the back of that picture that I showed you of an October view. The beans are beginning to look pretty bad, but I have sown corn salad, which is a very useful little salad green. Extremely hardy. You don't ever have to worry about the hardiness of this plant. And um, it's got a nice thick root system. If I don't eat all this in the winter, I'll just dig it in as a uh, green manure crop in the spring. So now somebody out there I know is saying, what, she's mixing up all these plants? How am I gonna rotate my crops? Well, in this region for a garden, um, the important crops to rotate for disease management, for root diseases, um, there's just a few families that are really important. And um, everything else we don't really have a problem with, so crop rotation doesn't is, matter. So forget all the systems that go by, whether it's fruiting or flowering or roots. It's just like forget all of that stuff. It doesn't apply to a home garden. Crop rotation on a big scale like this to feed... Uh, to, to consider the nutrients in the soil is an important part of agriculture. There will be a legume crop, and then there'll be a heavy feeding crop, and then there will be grain crops to help manage the weeds, and then there'll be a legume crop again, and then there'll be a heavy feeding crop. But that is to manage nutrients. In a home garden, just put on another shovel of compost and you will have balanced up the nutrients. So don't worry about nutrient rotation for gardens. Just worry about the most um, uh, at-risk plants for disease. So, and it's root disease. It's soil-borne diseases have dormant spores that stay in the soil, and some only last for a year, some last for four years. There's a two really nasty diseases, they last much longer, but basically most of what we're worrying about um, would attack um, plants of a certain families and um, if the soil doesn't have those plants in it for three or four years, the spores starve to death. Basically, they just go, they just lose their viability and die. And there is, to some extent, um, root maggots and carrot rust fly and carrots. We only need a rotation of a couple months there to allow the flies to get out of the bed. So if you had carrots, I, I seed my carrots that I'm going to eat in the winter. I sow them on the 1st of July. And they're in the garden until the end of March. And then I take the carrots out because then I don't want them to sprout and grow tops and grow flowers. And if I really had to use that same bed again for carrots, in July I could do that. Because even if the carrot rust fly was in there, they would have all emerged by then. But it wouldn't be a good idea to take those carrots out and immediately plant parsnips or carrots or dill or cilantro that is susceptible to the same pest because they could be um, infested. So it's onion family. This is, if you rotate nothing else, do this. And in small gardens, it's hard to even do this, but this is really important because the onion family and potatoes are really high risk for disease. 
If you don't rotate, it doesn't mean you'll get disease, it just means that you have a higher risk. Potatoes are high risk because we buy seed potatoes and put them in the soil. Tomatoes and peppers are in that same family. Um, they're at risk if you put them in after potatoes. But if you have a good tomato spot and you're planting the pota tomatoes there in the same place every year, usually that's just fine. It works out fine because tomatoes and peppers are grown from seed and there's very low risk of bringing in diseases. If you can rotate your cabbage family plants on a two years at least, that would be great. Better if you could do better, but most of us grow an awful lot of these plants, so it's hard. And the carrot family, we just need a couple months between plantings to allow the rust flies to emerge. And I just put this little warning down here. You know, um, kale you can self-sow all over the garden and suddenly how are you going to rotate your cabbage family if the whole garden has kale seedlings? Or if dill or cilantro has gone all over the garden, then how are you gonna rotate your carrot family? So just be aware of that and, and be alert and uh, you know, make sure the beds don't have those plants in them if you're uh, trying to rotate the crops. But the good news is, is basically everything else. You can plant it wherever it works and whenever it works and you can interplant it. So you can use spinach and lettuce and some of these smaller plants on all kinds of interplanting and you don't have to worry about crop rotation. So we want to mulch all year round. That keeps the soil cooler in the summer, and warmer in the winter. It reduces water loss in the summer and protects the soil from erosion. Um, and as you saw earlier, it's building organic matter and controlling weeds. And um, I do, I rake the mulch off in the spring to allow the soil to warm up. But then as the seedlings grow up a bit, I put the mulch back. And you can use literally anything you can get a hold of. It's the same as I mentioned with um, adding organic matter to the soil. Anything. And leaves are fantastic. Um, but crop residues, even these corn stalks, I just chop them and lie them down on the soil. I don't even chop them up very finely. I just lay them down and they all decompose very quickly. So anything you can get. If you're going to buy straw, it's really expensive. Um, you know, so buy it in the fall when it's a little less expensive. I leave the bales out in the winter, uh, in the rain, and, till, and let all the seeds in the straw sprout. Keep, keep the strings on the bale and just leave it there. Then in the spring when you go to pull the straw off, it's kind of started to decompose and it comes off in flakes and sticks together really well. If you've ever undone the strings of a fresh bale of straw and then had a wind come up, you'll know that sticking together is a really good idea because straw just blows all over the place. A couple last slides on getting through the winter. Um, mulch again. And uh, in the fall, really beefing the mulch up. You see here, I'm really putting lots of leaves now right up around the necks of these little overwintered broccoli. Um, just get, get a really good layer on here. And then when it really turns cold, you put a layer of mulch um, right over the top of the root crops. This is because we want to protect the shoulders of the roots that stick up from the soil, the carrots and beets and things. If that gets frosted, then those roots will rot. They're, these plants don't need to grow, so the fact that you've covered right over their tops really doesn't matter. And it's really uh, the safest way to, to maintain that. That's a whole bed of carrots under there. And be ready for Arctic outbreaks. Um, you know, unfortunately, in February 2019, the Arctic outbreak went on for weeks, but usually it's only a few days. If it's um, going to be forecasted to be minus five, I tend to cover some leafy greens if I've got a tarp. Um, but the, the hardiest things like kale and uh, hardy leeks and uh, these winter broccolis, they're usually good till minus nine. If it's going to get colder than that where you are then it's really good to have some tarps. You can do this very informally, temporary. I just keep a pile of plastic tarps in the garage and a lot of rocks because we have Arctic outflow winds when that happens. And um, you need something really heavy to hold your tarps down. And then I just fold them up and put them back away when the weather warms up. If you want to have a permanent uh, cover, just make sure it's very sturdy and that the plastic can't flip off. You know, clipping plastic to, or sorry, you know, clipping a, a plastic onto uh, hoops works fine for summertime or springtime, but that will often just come apart in a bad winter wind. And of course, now we're getting windstorms. We had a bad windstorm here last 
the day before uh, or yesterday actually. And so um, if you're going to do this, make sure these are low profile, super sturdy. This little thing latches down. This was just something someone designed and it's got rebar legs on it. So uh, glass cold frames are wonderful for this because they're so heavy. And otherwise also brace for wind and snow. Um, heavy snow breaks plants off just as badly as heavy wind. And this is a great place to use your tomato cages. This is my winter broccoli and winter cauliflower getting ready to go through the winter. Um, and uh, I just, I, I take a tea towel and wrap it around the plants, holding all the leaves into the middle. And then I just winkle the tomato cage down on top. If you've got lots of extra tomato cages, put them down when the plants are smaller. Or just use um, three or four stakes around the stems. Um, the point is to get the plants through the winter without their necks getting broken or their roots torn up. If their leaves all blow off, it doesn't matter because they're going to grow all new leaves in the spring anyway. So really what we're trying to do here is just make sure that the stem doesn't get damaged or the roots get dislodged. And that, that can happen with heavy snow and heavy wind. So just a review of what I covered. Um, vegetables grow fast, but they need full sun, very fertile soil, uh, slightly acid soil. Most of the time we're going to need to add lime. They'll need water in the summer. And in order to have vegetables all year round, it, you've got to choose the right varieties just for the, you know, suited to the time of year and plant them at the right time. The only really critical planting times are the summer dates for the crops that you're going to eat in the winter. And then be prepared to protect your plants, whether they're seedlings from a heat wave or cold weather in, in, in January or February. Um, just be prepared to step in there and, and take care of them. Happy gardening. So we do have time for questions. I went a little longer than I thought, but I thought I would be good to emphasize the soil uh, fertility. So. Um, so Lynn, I guess you probably have the questions lined up. Um, coming in. Yep. Yeah, so um, Elaine Cameron asks, when you are making your own fertilizer using manure, does the manure have to be mature or can it be fresh? Manure should always be composted. So, you know, the old gardening books, you know, they would have, uh, you know, well-aged cow manure. Well, what happens to well-aged cow manure is that the rain has been on it for months and all that nitrogen has leached away into the environment where it is a pollutant and it's not available to your garden. Um, manures that come from commercial farms should always be composted because of the risk of human disease in the manure. So if you're getting horse manure, it's advisable to compost, but it's less, you don't really need to for safety's sake. But if it's cow or chicken or pig manure, it absolutely must be hot composted before you use it. Okay. Um, Andrew asks, when is the best time to compost, fall or spring? It's when you've got the stuff. Now, if you're gonna compost, a lot of um, garden waste and leaves then the best thing to do is pile all that material into the bins and then when you have the leaves in the fall you can make your final compost put layers of leaves and garden waste and maybe you can get some manure at that time what you also definitely don't want to ever do is put manure out um, in your garden in the fall uh, don't spread it in the fall because it just leaches away all the nitrogen so if you actually are lucky enough to get manure, then layer it in the fall in together with leaves and garden waste and whatever else material. And then you, it, it's, it's moistened as you're composting, but then cover it, put a lid on it, um, something to shed water. You need air circulation, but you've got to have that rainwater not percolating through the compost and um, basically just taking away the nitrogen. Mm. Okay. Um, Richard asks, I have new raised beds with new garden soil, and I believe there is wire worm in it. Do you have advice on how to deal with this? Um, yes, we can go quickly through. Oh, can you see all the pictures that I have here? I'll find my wire worm pictures. This is easier than if, how fast can you guys read? Oh, there's the wire worms. Ah. I am surprised if it's new soil, that in fact, that you have wire worms, unless there was lawn underneath. 
uh, in which case it's not a surprise because the beetles, this is one species, there are other ones that are similar looking, they're just brown, um, come in the spring and lay eggs on um, grasses and weeds and they love lawns. And then these little tiny larvae, they start out really small and they get, they're, when they're about this size is when we notice them, but it takes three or four years for them to get this size. So when you first do a garden out of, out of a lawn, you will have wireworms for sure. And I'm not really quite sure why you might have wireworms in, in new soil that you bought, but um, you can trap them. I'll show you uh, right now, uh, chunks of potato on a stick and mm -hmm. bury it in the soil an inch or two. And these are wireworms that have been attracted to the potato and they just burrow right through it. And you can, um, you know, well, I'm really cheap. I do this every spring, but I, uh, I pull out the wireworms and reuse yeah. the potato. But uh, whatever you want to do, you can clear them out of the bed before you plant. Um, they are quite hard on things like corn seedlings. This is a seedling that was failing and there was the wireworm burrowing right in. But mostly they damage potatoes and carrots, that sort of crop. Mm -hmm. So okay. yeah, hand pick them as you see them. Don't leave any weeds in your garden for over winter and never use fall rye as a cover crop because mm -hmm. that just gets filled up with wireworms again in the spring. Mm -hmm. and, and by adding, by using leaves as your garden mulch, that does control the weeds while you're feeding the soil and it makes it much less hospitable for wireworms. So after three or four years of, of cleaning them out of the soil and not allowing them to come back, then the last of the ones should be maturing. And uh, then you'll have, you know, relatively few to deal with. Okay. So Nancy writes, I have sun chokes in the garden bed and they keep popping up in places where we have seeded things and they have uprooted them. Any suggestions on how to handle this? No, but if I wasn't an organic gardener, I'd use Roundup on the darn things. But uh, no, I'm afraid <laughs> you're just gonna have to dig them up. They are very invasive. Uh, some people really like them. Uh, they're, better, they're better and worse flavors of sunchokes. Some are not too, too bad. I'm, I'm not real fond of them myself, but definitely it is, a, it is just an invasive weed problem. And basically all you can do is just keep digging them up. If you keep catching them as they first sprout, um, then I know it's gonna disrupt the plants that were there, but just keep at it I and mean, you will eventually get there. There is no real easy solution because really every little bit of root will sprout. Okay. So the next question is uh, a container garden um, from Neris. My garden is my deck. I plant lettuce and tomatoes and some herbs. What advice can you give me for planting winter crops in pots on my deck? Um, well, um, the biggest pots possible or pots that you can drag right up against the house to keep them a little warmer. The thing is that plants in pots, the roots are exposed to cold more than they would be if they were growing in, in soil and roots are less um, adapted to cold. So tops of plants can take cold more than the roots can. So what you'll need to do is be able to have them quite protected. You certainly can grow winter crops, but I would stick with crops that are pretty hardy, like kale and things like that, and, um, and try and, and, and move them into a pretty protected area to do it. Um, you could seed underneath that tomato plant in the same pot. You could sow that corn salad or winter lettuces in, in, in uh, the end of August, just in that same pot where you have your tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I've been gardening in my backyard for three years, and this is the first year that I've had mushrooms popping up in my garden. They are also popping up in my new raised beds, which have purchased soil, compost, and leaf mold. Are mushrooms a sign of good nutrient content? Should I be concerned? Um, they're not really a sign of anything other than spores are in there and spores are everywhere. Um, so don't be concerned. I, you know, if, if you've got children or pets that might eat the mushrooms, um, people will go out in the morning and just make sure they stomp down the, the mushrooms because then no one's tempted to pick one. Most of them are not poisonous, but occasionally somebody gets, uh, you know, can have some pretty bad reactions. Otherwise, they're just um, the fruiting form of what are really like roots, mycelium in the soil, and they're just part of the natural system that's decomposing that plant material. Mm -hmm. And there probably was some woody waste in that soil that you bought. It's composted. 
but it'll it'll you know this is the west west coast we have a lot of mushrooms uh, species if it's not warm and wet the, we don't see them that we've had a warm and wet spring uh, relatively warm but certainly wet and uh, it's just perfect conditions but i wouldn't worry about them at all it's not an indication of anything particularly okay so the next person can't grow spinach help and yeah that's they didn't say anything else that's it can't grow spinach <laughs> um probably you're seeding your spinach in the spring because that's when everybody thinks they're supposed to seed their spinach um spinach is a funny little plant and we live way too far north for spinach to do well the reason is that spinach in response to our long days i mean this far north right now look how late it is uh, really late and those long days that just makes spinach go to seed and um, if you seed spinach in march it'll go to seed now if you seed it in may it'll go to seed now and if you seed it now it comes up going to seed it's very disappointing wow. <laughs> but if you seed it in august the days are getting substantially shorter and uh, I kind of buzzed by it. I had a picture where I showed you some spinach that I sowed in August and I was picking it in April. That's the same plants. So um, one or two might go to seed when you seed them in August, but most don't. And they grow, you can pick spinach from those plants all fall. And then there's not too much replacement in the winter. I find I don't count on spinach in January, but the roots come back to a huge crop in the spring. And then they go to seed at this time of year along with all the rest of the spinach. Wow. So if you see the spinach in you know about the second week of August, okay. those plants are just being pulled out of my garden now. But if you try to seed it here in the spring, it's it's a very short crop. But when you, you harvest spinach, Linda, do you harvest the whole plant or do you just take the leaves off? I just off take the leaves one? off until the plant goes to seed and then trying to prevent the plant from going to seed never works. They it's just they're just gonna do it. Okay. So even trying to break that flower out, you won't get more leaves that way. So up until the flowers form, I pick leaves off. But when the flowers form, my last harvest is to take the whole plant out. Mm, okay. I just did yes. that, actually. Right. Except the roots, right? You leave roots. Yeah, I just, leave, I just cut them, bring them into the kitchen, pop right. off the leaves I want, and then yeah. that's it. Good. Okay. Um, next question is, can you please help me understand the downsides of using non-organic fertilizer? Uh, you're, you're very soluble fertilizer. Um, well, one of the downsides is, is it is so soluble that um, when you put it in the soil, it doesn't stay there. It's not slow release. So for one thing, in between each crop, you're going to have to put fertilizer. Uh, plants can use that nitrogen that comes from the chemical fertilizer. I mean, it goes right on by. They can take it too and use it, but it also leaches out. And when nitrogen leaves your property, it is, a, it is a serious pollutant when it goes into a ditch and goes into a stream and goes into a harbor. Um, and globally, we're having a lot of trouble with excess nitrogen in the atmosphere. It's one of the greenhouse gases. So there is this soluble fertilizer. Um, and also, in the presence of that kind of nutrient supply, these soil microbes do not break down the organic matter. The, the whole thing kind of comes to a halt. So some of those organisms will be there and some won't, but you won't have this complete system that is um, breaking down organic matter and feeding the plants. So, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of good reasons not to use it. And you don't need to um, because the organic fertilizers are really very good, but they stay in the soil and they don't leave your property. Okay. Um, and sorry, there's also an acidifying effect of some of the nitrogen fertilizers. Mm -hmm. The chemical fertilizers do acidify the soil. Right. Okay. Um, oh, and sorry, you, you know, I was asked this question earlier by yeah. someone else. Yeah. And I wanted to say um, the organic material, uh, sorry, it's the Rodale Research Institute. And I'm just trying to remember what the name of it is. If you Google that, oh, I've just gone blank. I think it's Organic Research Institute. It's in, the, it's in Pennsylvania. They have some really good, very in-depth um, reports, and they're all available online. You have to register, but they don't cost anything. And then you can read some extremely in-depth reports on how to hold carbon in the soil, the impact of, of soluble fertilizers on microbes in the soil, and that sort of thing. Okay, so great. So you'll learn a lot more about that. Yeah, excellent. 
Um, so Jane is asking, does Rime work for shading seedlings in summer? Oh, I'm glad you brought that up because I meant to mention that. Not a good plan. Um, Rime is meant to keep heat in. Um, so just putting it over the plants and draping it down to the soil would keep heat in and would make the situation worse. I have actually used Rime by taking it and folding it over four or five times and then laying it just on top of sticks. So in fact, it isn't acting like Rime at all. It's just like a piece of fabric. So as long as you're you know, not using it like Rime would be used to completely cover a crop, which would actually do the opposite of what we want. Okay, okay. Um, is it okay to add boron to beets? That we, you don't need it. It's, it's really not okay to be um, messing around with uh, micronutrients like this. And the boron is an interesting situation because um, soil sterilant herbicides are made with boron. You can kill everything if you, if you screw this up. Um, it is, um, it is it's one of those dose makes the poison. It's a perfect example. Um, and, and you just won't need it. Um, so again, the kind of ingredients that go into compost and the complete organic fertilizers actually have a, all these elements in there. So you really don't need to do it. It's very risky to be playing around with uh, boron, um, Epsom salts, all these kinds of strange things that people put on their gardens. Okay. Um, Irene is asking, when is the best time to lime the garden? Uh, yesterday. That was it. <laughs> um, you can lime anytime. Um, if you didn't do it, you know, the next time the soil is open, lime. Um, if you were, um, if you had a lot of soil that didn't have plants in it in the fall, liming in the fall is great because it has all winter to work in the soil. It takes quite a while for lime to change the pH. But um, just lime whenever you're in there. Just do it once a year. And there's no toxicity. I mean, you can lime and seed five minutes later. It's just ground up rock. So it's, uh, there isn't any downside to liming. Um, but do it as soon as you can. If you haven't limed, then try and lime immediately for the crop now, anything that's not been planted yet. Okay. Um, so she's also asking, in the photographs of your cauliflower, there are these white squares of paper. Oh, those are little... Um, those are little barriers here, and this is what I'm showing you. Um, it's actually, in this case, it's plastic, or um, it could be thin foam or waterproof paper, anything that would last kind of most of the growing season. And this is, it's a six inch, 15 centimeter square, and I've cut a slit down to the middle, and I cut a little tiny X. And so it needs to be a material that isn't too stiff, because you can see I've slipped it around the stem of this little plant. This is a cauliflower here or something. Um, because cabbage root maggot comes and lays its eggs right here where the stem goes into the soil. And it won't lay its eggs out here because there's no plant. And if there was lettuce out here, it wouldn't lay its eggs on that. So it only wants to lay its eggs beside a cabbage plant, a cabbage family plant. So this little barrier um, prevents most of them from doing that. And you just put the mulch over the top and you just leave it for the rest of the season and don't even think about it. But if you've ever had a patch of cabbage or cauliflower broccoli where one plant looks fine and one plant dies and a couple plants don't do very well. It's very spotty. That is very typical of cabbage root maggot attack. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Nancy wants to know, uh, let's see, I collected my parsley last week and noticed lots of aphids. Is it because the plant is under stress? The parsley has overwintered and I'm wondering if it is time to cut them down before it goes to seed or let them go to seed. Um, it might have been a bit dry. Aphids do like plants that are a bit drought stressed, um, but aphids on parsley um, are not going to necessarily go on anything else. Um, aphids are very, there's aphids for different crops. So if they're on the beans, they stay on beans. You know, if they're on the roses, they stay on the roses. Um, really let that, if you can possibly leave that um, parsley and let it go to flower, it's just fantastic for beneficial insects. That will attract aphid predators into your garden. So that, you know, by leaving those uh, uh, to flower, you will actually solve the aphid problem and solve the aphid problem on other plants as well. Um, okay, is it okay to use weeds for compost once dried? 
Or sure, should it be or just as mulch. Yeah, as long as if they have seeds, then obviously that isn't such a good plan. But anytime you weed, like if you're weeding right now, you can pull a weed up and leave it right there on the soil. You don't even have to haul it away to compost it. But mm -hmm. yes, as long as the weed seeds are not formed yet, they're fantastic um, components in your compost or your mulch. Hmm. Okay. Um, Tracy wants to know, how do I get less rhubarb leaf and thicker stalk? That might be a variety. Uh, he might, uh, you know, some of the, the variety that has very green stalks uh, has really thick stalks, but the rhubarb red one doesn't have very thick stalks. There's, there's some differences in the varieties of rhubarb. That may not be something that you can change. I can't, can't think of any way that you would alter that. If the leaves are really big, then the plant's doing well, and the, thought, and the, the, the stalks are thin. That's just, that's probably the variety of rhubarb it is. Mm. Um, I'm just going to follow up with her other comment is that her rhubarb starts to wilt and die off at this time of year. Okay, now that is a, that's a disease problem. And I would, again, I would start with rhubarb root from, a, you know, a, a completely different root from a clean, a clean supply and put it in a different place. But that can, that it can very much be a root disease, yeah. And this okay. is a, Unfortunately, the weather we've had for certain soil-borne diseases, uh, they're, they're, it's just been perfect for those mm. uh, diseases to spread. Mm. Um, okay, so Yvonne is putting in a plant bed soon and she's noticed some grub in the lawn. Is it okay to put bed over top? Um, is, I am going to be layering cardboard before putting the soil down. Okay, don't, don't put that cardboard down. Um, that would be the first thing. Um, I, I'm not sure what grubs might be in the soil. Um, I don't know. Uh, it depends what it is. Um, most of them would be probably not a problem for vegetables, but I don't know. I don't know what the what the what the insect is. But but really, don't put that cardboard between the natural soil and your new soil. You really want to mix some of that natural soil into your new soil because you want your native beneficial organisms that are in that soil to be mixed in there and you want the natural flow of water and you want roots to be able to get past if you put in uh, if it's law if it's lawn right now and you're concerned about killing that just putting a deep layer of soil on top will do the same thing as the cardboard would have done so yeah um, just put the soil in on top and uh, that's that's sufficient okay um Asparagus, uh, oh, any yeah. asparagus tips for interplanting? And does anyone have any, oh, <laughs> I don't think you're gonna be able to answer. Does, any, does anyone have any Jersey crowns they'd like to sell? <laughs> yes, well. I have to put that on Craigslist. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, the uh, tip with asparagus is don't do any interplanting. I mean, honestly, those plants need huge amounts of nutrients. Feed them incredibly generously. Make sure the soil has been limed. Um, and um, heavy, thick mulches in the summer, and do everything you can to just feed them, feed them, feed them. They uh, just need a lot of nutrients. Okay. So and you're right, Jersey Knight's a really good, uh, really good one. It's an excellent mm -hmm. one, but it is getting a bit late to try and find them. So, Linda, we've got 11 more questions, and I haven't even got to the chat. And how, how are you doing for your time? Uh, let's do a few more minutes. I can hear my puppy is having a dream on the couch. I can hear her whooping <laughs> in her sleep. So I've got a few more minutes. So I'm, okay. I'm going to stay on if that's going to. Okay. Possible. Um, the next question is about spittle bugs. Uh, mm. This person noticed some today on their arugula. Just wash them off. Just blast a little blast of water. The poor little creature that's inside there, the spit, the spit foam, it's, it's, a, it's a juvenile of a, of a, of a little bug. Um, it, once it's washed out of the foam, it just dies. So you can blast it off with water. You don't, there's no need to spray anything. Uh, and it's just a temporary stage. I mean, in, 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 a, in a week or two, they'll be gone, or two weeks or so, and you won't notice them anymore. So just, yeah, just wash them off with water. Okay, okay. Um, then another rhubarb question is that uh, Susan is wondering whether um, rhubarb leaves could be put down as a mulch. Absolutely, sure. Excellent. Big fat leaves like that. Okay. Even though they're 
I guess they're toxic for humans. Well, they're, they're not toxic. They have um, oxalic acid, which is the same thing as in spinach and chard, but in high quantities. So mm. it's not a toxicity as such. If we ate them, it would tie up calcium in our bodies, but it's fantastic to use as a mulch. There's okay. nothing wrong with that at all. Okay, I'm gonna do two more. So the next one is about leeks uh, from Laurel. I planted small, and by small she means uh, eight to 10 inches tall, leeks this week. Will they overwinter or be eaten this summer? It's entirely up to you. Uh, one, first, they won't overwinter unless it's a hardy variety. Now, there are, they aren't all hardy. Some are just what they call fall leeks and they will freeze out. So if it was a hardy variety, you could overwinter them. But leeks are something that can be eaten practically at any size. I mean, you know, a centimeter wide right up to big fat leeks. They're all edible and they're all usable. So it's entirely up to you as to how and when you want to harvest them. Okay. But it will depend very much, if, you know, if it's going to be trying to overwinter them, it's got to be a frost hardy one. Right. And um, I'll just do one one more, and I, I do apologize. There's so many, so many questions, <laughs> um, but I will answer, get Linda to answer one more. Um, I've made compost tea and put it in containers with lids to put on the garden on a regular basis. However, I just read that I may have introduced parasites by not keeping it open to the air. Could I rectify by just taking lids off for a few days, or not risk ruining my great garden and make new compost tea? Um, compost tea that's been sitting like that, there is a risk of um, disease organisms. Uh, I wouldn't put that on a garden. Any, I would dump it in your compost bin, that'll be fine. I mean, use it to moisten compost um, or pour it on the soil. Um, I would start over. Um, there's aerated compost tea, but when you're just sitting there and it's just soaking, um, you'll notice when I said earlier about making these uh, nutrient teas, it's only for a day or two that we're soaking it. And the purpose is to extract the soluble nutrients. And once we've done that, we can just take the spent manure or whatever we're using in the bucket and put it on the soil somewhere as a mulch. Um, so we're not leaving it set. Um, you, you do get some pretty peculiar things. There is some human health risk just sitting there holding compost tea like that. And there's no real benefit to it. Um, you know, despite what you may have read, um, you know, usually someone is selling a product like this. It's, if you've got a healthy soil already with soil microbes, there isn't really any advantage to trying to brew up some microorganisms and pour them on already healthy soil. It's like, uh, you know, selling someone a can of oxygen to breathe when you've actually got pretty, pretty good air. If you're in downtown Tokyo, yeah, you buy a can of oxygen to breathe. But if you're living out where the air is good, then there's really no need for it. So I would just dump that out. And I wouldn't put it right on something that you're going to eat fresh, like salad greens. I would pour it under broccoli or on a fruit tree or something like that or put it in the compost. And um, probably not bother making it um, unless you need to soak up some nutrients or something to make a, a nutrient mix. You do get some really strange insects living in there. Um, there's some, <laughs> those sounds awful, they're called rat-tailed maggots that will uh, colonize water like that. And you get some pretty strange organisms. It's not safe. Mm. Wow, okay. <laughs> well, I have, I have a question that I want to ask and present really quickly. Uh -huh. I just want to do these slides on squash because this is a really common problem and nobody asked about it yet, but I bet you if we did this in July, somebody would ask. Um, it's, you have a squash, the, the flowers come and then the flowers fall off and the little squash grows for a while and then the little squash stops growing and it shrivels up and it rots or falls off. And people think that maybe they didn't water enough or what it, something was wrong. What was wrong was the flower never actually got fertilized. It didn't get mm. pollinated. So what you have to do is go look at your squash plant in the morning and look for female flowers, which have the little baby version of whatever it is. This is a zucchini here. And male flowers, which have just a straight stem. There's pollen in that male flower, and it has to get to the female flower. And we have a lot less insects to do that now. Um, and if it's rainy weather, the insects aren't going to do it anyway. 
So what you need to do is go find your female flower. Here, here it's open in the middle. You can see what the middle of it looks like. Pick the male flower and pull the petals back and just tap that yellow dust, the pollen is right here. Just tap it in the middle of your female flower. You can see this is gonna be a female flower that hasn't opened yet. And this is one that's already opened and shriveled up. The flowers only last for one day in the summer. So, you know, on your way out of the house in the morning, if you're just going to work, that's just a perfect time to do it. Grab a male flower and you can tap it on several squashes. If you've got one male flower and many female flowers, it's fine. Great. So just you can't, do that. Right, and and you can't, you can't over pollinate, <laughs> can you? Nope, you can't overdo it. Um, the only thing is, is that the slightly complicating thing, and I'll just quickly um, um, go through it, is that we have three species of squash we grow, and you kind of have to stay within the group. Now, if you take a zucchini flower, you can go to patty pans and acorns and another zucchini. Uh, all kinds of squashes are in that family of summer squash. And if you look at the West Coast Seeds Catalog, right there underneath the name of the variety, it will say whether it's a Pepo, a Maxima, or a Machada. And if you know that, it's really handy because then you can use a male flower from any Pepo to go to any other Pepo. Now, if you don't know what variety you've got, this is all too much trouble, just stick with a male flower from the same plant to the same female. Uh, to the a female flower in the same plant. But it is handy to know because um, sometimes a, it's very perverse. One squash plant will have one male and there'll be about 10 female plants on every, uh, flowers on everything else. And then the next time there's, you know, only male flowers and hardly any female flowers. So if you know that you can take that one male flower and go to many different female squash on different plants, it's really quite handy. That's great. And, and someone actually said in the chat that they've had this problem, so they really appreciate Everybody it. Everybody has this problem. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Just, uh, just remember the female flower has the little fruit. It'll mm -hmm. look like it'll be round if it's a pumpkin or heart-shaped if it's an acorn, but that's not the one to pick. You pick the male <laughs> flower. <laughs> okay, okay, good. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Wow. So, so terrific. So much information. It's just great. And there's loads of thank yous in the chat, Linda, for oh, good. Good. this. So thank you so much. And yeah, and uh, there again is her book. And uh, I think you, uh, you can order it from your website, right? Yes, you can, or go to your bookstore, but support your local bookstore. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can order it from me, but I, I'm sorry, the postage from me is fairly expensive because postage is just really expensive. So you can get it uh, from your bookstore. Probably you won't have to pay postage. And you can certainly get it from me and I'll have it in the mail the next day. Great, okay, good. All right, well, thank you again so much for doing this second talk. I just, it's been great. And they say the thank yous keep pouring in from the chat. So I know people have really, really appreciated it. Yeah, great, good, okay, all right. Thanks everybody for coming and thank you for all your questions. I'm very sorry we didn't get to all of them. I think we would have been here till midnight. We yes. did that, but uh, yeah. much appreciated <laughs> your participation. <laughs> okay, and you better take care of that little doggy. Yeah, your, it's, it's doggy? Pippy. Yes, we'll have to get little Pippy out here. Pippy, okay, good night, good night, Linda, good night, Pippy. <laughs> okay, see ya. Bye-bye.